Hello, I am Thomas Hamilton, Director of the Survey and Certification Group in the Center for Medicaid and State Operations. I would like to welcome you to the first in a series of satellite presentations for surveyors featuring clinical updates and survey guidance. An important goal at CMS is to provide ongoing information for surveyors to enhance their knowledge in clinical areas and to provide guidance that promotes consistency in the survey process. We also wish to make important information available to the many providers, consumers, and organizations who are so integral in ensuring the well-being of our nation's nursing home residents. This particular broadcast is part one of a two-part presentation on the care of residents who have dementia in long-term care facilities. We at CMS, along with the Alzheimer's Association, felt the need to provide updates on clinical issues which challenge both the nursing home staff in providing care for residents who have Alzheimer's and related dementias, and also surveyors in evaluating the care the residents receive in relation to their identified needs. In addition to this presentation, you can look forward to future presentations on other clinical issues, including the care of residents who have urinary incontinence and the prevention and treatment of pressure ulcers. We remain committed to the care of individuals who reside in nursing homes and specifically to the care that responds to challenges offered by individuals who have dementia or related conditions. Thank you for joining us today and most importantly, thank you for all your efforts to improve the delivery of services to individuals in our nation's nursing homes. Thank you, Thomas, and good afternoon and welcome to our broadcast, everyone. Uh, today we're beginning the first of a two-part series on dementia care in long-term care facilities. The second show will be broadcast on March 26, 2004. We're planning on providing the medical background of dementia on today's show and addressing issues that surveyors encounter on nursing home surveys on the second show. We have an expert panel on the broadcast today that includes a surveyor from the CMS Boston Regional Office, that's Sharon Roberson, and two physicians, Dr. Richard Powers and Dr. Charles Cresilius, who will join us in just a few minutes. Today, we're going to be looking at the basics of dementia, including issues surrounding differential diagnosis, causes, symptoms, physiologic changes to the brain, and stage dementia, and some current studies and research on the disease. As regular viewers of our broadcast, uh, you're, nowhere, um, you're no doubt aware that we often have a live question and answer session with our guest at periodic intervals during the program. This time, however, we're going to open up the phones and the fax lines right now uh, at the beginning of the program, and we're going to take calls as they come in throughout the course of the show. So if you have a question, there's no need to wait for an official Q&A session to start. Just go ahead and call, and we'll take your call. Uh, to call in your questions, you can dial 1-800-953-2233. If you'd like to fax in your question, you can call us at 1-410-786-0123. Again, that's 1-800-953-2233 for the phone. And for the fax, it's 1-410-786-0123. All right, now that we've got the technical details out of the way, we're going to get started. And we're going to start today's show with an introduction to the topic of dementia care in nursing homes by our CMS Regional Office Nurse Surveyor, Sharon Roberson. Sharon Roberson is a nurse consultant with the Boston Regional Office of CMS. She's been with CMS since 1991. Sharon is a registered nurse who conducts surveys in the New England states. She is also a contributing instructor at both the National Long-Term Care Basic Training and Hospital Basic Training. She's also been a nursing home administrator, um, and we'd like to thank you for being here, Sharon. Thank you, Doris. Uh, I know you've had a lot of experience of observing, um, uh, observing the care of residents with dementia uh, from a surveyor's perspective, and I understand that a large portion of the nursing home population may be diagnosed with the dementia. I also understand that there are a lot of issues related to everyday care and services. So uh, if you would, uh, explain to our audience why CMS has decided to produce this series on dementia. Well, Doris, surveyors of nursing homes have been noting for some time that there is an increasing number of nursing home residents who have some form of dementia. CMS has had meetings with the National Alzheimer's Association to discuss issues that surveyors are seeing. 
Because of these meetings, CMS has chosen to bring together clinical experts who can assist us in providing the most up-to-date knowledge for our federal and state surveyors about dementia, including what happens to the brain, how the progression of the disease affects functioning, and importantly, what interventions nursing home staff can use to take care of the residents who have dementia. How prevalent is the problem? In nursing homes, the number of residents with some form of dementia is quite large. We've run data from the MDS system as of December 2003. And as of that date, there were 16,333 certified nursing homes with 1.4 million residents. Many people think that most people with dementia have Alzheimer's disease. But here's what our database shows. Of the 1.4 million residents in nursing homes, 17.3% have Alzheimer's disease and 37% have some other form of dementia. So out of 1.4 million residents, 54.3% have some form of dementia and that's over 753,000 people. Wow, I mean I had no idea that those were the figures. Uh, obviously with that kind of incidence, uh, this is an issue I think which surveyors must be aware. Absolutely, Doris. With that many residents affected by some form of dementia, it's essential that staff make themselves aware of the symptoms of dementia and how the disease affects functioning and behavior. I'd like to identify some of the issues surveyors are seeing. We see residents with short and long-term memory problems. They may not remember the location of their room, or they may misplace personal belongings such as their glasses or hearing aids. Often they don't even remember family or staff members and find themselves anxious when they're approached by people they think are strangers. They often believe that they are considerably younger and perhaps are still at home with their families, even though many of their family members are deceased. They might spend hours each day searching for their family, yet not even recognize them when they do visit, perhaps not even recognizing their spouse. Some residents have difficulty in making decisions, such as what to wear or whether to go to an activity or not. Some have mood and behavior symptoms with comments like, I wish I was dead, asking repetitive questions such as, where do I go? Who put me here? Continuously calling out for help or repeatedly saying such things as, help me, help me. Some have persistent anger at their placement in the nursing home and frequently insist that they're going home or they can be seen waiting at the door for someone to take them home. Some have unrealistic fears, such as the fear of being abandoned or left alone. Others may have disturbances in their sleep cycles. They confuse day and night. Some have physically abusive behaviors, such as pinching, hitting, biting, scratching. Or some may have socially disruptive symptoms, such as screaming, disrobing, smearing food or feces, or even rummaging through other belongings. Some resist staff during personal care. They may refuse to eat or even take medications. Some residents wander, which is when they have movement with no purpose discernible to staff. When they do this, they're often oblivious to their own needs or safety. There are so many challenging symptoms that residents have with dementia. So Sharon, these are the kinds of things that surveyors really need to be aware of. Absolutely, Doris. Well, you can see with these issues that challenge nursing home staff, it challenges them as to how to effectively assess the resident needs, develop an individualized care plan based upon the resident needs, implement the care and services, and keep these residents and those who live around them safe while enhancing their quality of life and their highest practicable level of well-being. Staff must understand both the disease process and the functional changes it brings and the approaches they may use to try and minimize some of the more distressing symptoms. For the surveyors, it's also a challenge to be able to assess the adequacy of the services the facility is providing to meet the needs of those residents with special symptoms of dementia. And that's why <coughs> CMS has decided to produce these two broadcasts, correct? Correct. It's important for both nursing home surveyors and staff to have the most current information about the disease processes symptoms caused by damage in certain areas of the brain, and what interventions can be used to address those symptoms. So we at CMS have developed these two presentations on dementia that we believe will help both surveyors and facilities. The first presentation will provide information about Alzheimer's and the other types of dementia, how they affect the brain, 
and how those brain changes affect the way a resident responds. The second satellite will be more centered on SEVEA issues related to their evaluation of the interventions the facility is using. Specifically, the surveyor has to make determinations to the adequacy of the facility's assessment of resident needs, the plan of care, and how well the care meets the identified needs of the residents. For this second broadcast, we're planning on having a psychologist and a nurse who are experts in dementia care, as well as two physicians from this broadcast. We're planning to cover issues surveyors are observing. These issues will be presented to the experts so they can discuss why the resident is acting in certain ways and the different ways the facility may respond to these issues. Well, it seems like a great idea, Sharon. Um, I guess only one problem comes to mind. It seems uh, that to me that many of these behavioral issues are the kind of thing that you really need to see uh, to understand rather than just talk about. I agree completely, Doris. That's why to make the second satellite more specific to surveyor needs, We've gathered video footage of many of the behavioral issues surveyors commonly see in nursing homes regarding residents with dementia. Well, I think that should work well and uh, provide surveyors with some useful concrete examples. In addition, to make the shows even more useful, we'd also like to know what issues surveyors would like us to cover on our next show. They can do that after this show is completed by sending CMS their issues in enough detail so that we can address those issues that are most problematic in the second broadcast. That way we can be sure to cover not only what we think are the most important issues, but also what the surveyors who are watching today's show think are important as well. All right. And those issues can be faxed to CMS at 1-410-786-6730. And then mark your fax dementia show. Or you can send your questions by email to Kay Shoneman at cms.hhs.gov. Uh, either option should be sent by March 12th. And please be aware that uh, while we will try to get all of your issues before the experts, our time is going to be limited. And so uh, we're going to cover the most common issues during the broadcast. Thanks, Doris. All right. Thank you, Sharon. I mean, I think you brought out some facts that uh, I wasn't aware of. Uh, it seems that nursing homes caring for people with dementia need a lot of knowledge about what's happening to each person that they serve. And to get a better feel for what dementia really is and how it can be diagnosed, uh, we've asked Dr. Powers to prepare a short segment to introduce you to some typical symptoms of dementia and a diagnostic overview of the disease. Dr. Powers is a geriatric psychiatrist and neuropathologist. Uh, he trained at the University of Kentucky in Johns Hopkins Hospital, and he is currently Associate Professor of Pathology in the Division of Neuropathology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He is the Director of the Bureau of Geriatric Psychiatry for the Department of Mental Health for the State of Alabama, and oversees the Dementia Education and Training Program for the State of Alabama as well. Now, let's take a look at the presentation. Today we're going to be talking about a very important issue in long-term care, and that is the confused elder. The goals for this uh, talk include, first of all, to explain why this is important to somebody who is working in the long-term care setting. Secondly, we want to discuss how common confusion is in the older uh, resident in a long-term care facility. We want to outline the kind of knowledge that we would expect a uh, long-term care professional to understand. And then we want to try to tie the kinds of brain changes that occur in things like depression and dementia with the kind of behaviors that you have to actually manage when you're out there on the units. In order to cover this, we're going to talk about what I call the three D's of confusion, which is depression, delirium, and dementia. Why are we talking about this? Because, of course, it's a common problem. Some studies show that up to 80% of long-term care residents, nursing home residents, have some sort of a DSM diagnosis. Uh, up to 60% may suffer from some form of uh, dementia. So consequently, if you're in the long-term care business, you're in the neuropsychiatric management business. And although we're not capable of talking about all of the issues that you're going to confront uh, today, we will cover most of the most important issues that you're going to see with regards to the management of these individuals. In order to understand brain malfunction, you first have to understand how the brain functions normally. So what I thought we would do is begin by briefly reviewing uh, how the brain is structured and the kinds of systems that you're going to see malfunction in a person with depression or dementia. To begin with, there are three major systems that you will see in the brain. 
There is the functionally compartmentalized cerebral cortex. Uh, there is the subcortical processing centers, such as the thalamus and the basal ganglia. And then there are the brainstem centers that uh, produce uh, neuromodulators like norepinephrine and dopamine. To begin with, let's look at the normal brain. Here you see the uh, lateral view of a uh, normal brain, and up here we see the frontal lobes. Different brain regions do different things. So for instance, the frontal lobes are involved with things like personality, social control, uh, social graces, impulse modulation. Here we see the motor strip. This, these are the neurons that actually move your arms and your legs. Here we see the parietal lobe. This part of the brain is involved with integrating incoming sensory information, for instance, to tell you where your arms and legs are located. Back here, we see the occipital lobes. These are involved with uh, visual recognition and visual integration. And down here, we see the temporal lobes. These are involved with very sophisticated uh, sensory processing, such as uh, understanding uh, spoken word. Down below, what we see is the, uh, is the brain stem, and that's where many neuromodulators are located, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. When we're talking about deeper structures, which you'll see here with the arrow pointing to the thalamus, the, this is a nucleus that's located deep inside the brain and it, it integrates upcoming sensory information. This is important because when it's damaged, it can produce things like thalamic pain syndromes. Over here, we see the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia consists of things like the caudate nucleus and the globus pallidus and putamen. This is what is termed the extrapyramidal system. So out here, you see the pyramidal system, which moves your arms and your legs according to your thoughts and your wishes. And down here, we see the extrapyramidal system, which is involved with things like muscle tone and balance. Let's talk a little bit about how the motor system is, uh, is organized. In this slide here, the part of the brain where the uh, motor strip is located that actually moves your arms and your legs. So for instance, if I want to move uh, my hand into a 45 degree position, uh, my motor strip tells the arm to move. My sensory neurons uh, tell me where that arm is in three dimensional space. And my extra pyramidal system balances the flexors and the extensors to allow me to maintain it in an even balanced way. Of course, if I have a stroke, I can't move my arm. If the parietal lobe that integrates sensory information doesn't tell me where it is, then I sometimes may stumble when I'm trying to move it. And if my basal ganglia, if my extrapyramidal system malfunctions, then I won't be able to hold it steady. Oftentimes, drugs will produce what are called extrapyramidal symptoms, stiffness, rigidity, and shaking. And in the uh, survey guidelines that you use, F329 through F333, they expect you to understand the common side effects of antipsychotic medications. In order to understand extrapyramidal symptoms, you have to understand how the motor system works. Now let's talk a little bit about how the sensory system works. Sensory function is broken down into different compartments. So for instance, in this picture of the uh, temporal lobe of the brain, Right there where it says TTG, that stands for the transverse temporal gyrus. That is where you are hearing what I am saying. The STG further up stands for the superior temporal gyrus, where you are understanding what I am saying. Further anterior is the temporal pole, and that is where it is all synthesized as a message. The planum temporale, which is the PT, actually organizes your thought uh, into sort of auditory or verbal thoughts. Different brain regions in the temporal lobe receive and organize sensory information in a different way. I'm going to show you a little later on what happens, for instance, in Alzheimer's disease, where the transverse temporal gyrus is not damaged, so the patients continue to hear without difficulty. However, the superior temporal gyrus and the temporal pole are damaged, and they do not understand what is being said to them. Now let's talk a little bit about the brainstem. The brainstem is a place where neuromodulators are located. There are three major types of transmitters that you need to be familiar with in the brain in order to understand the kinds of medications that you're going to see used in your residence. There are uh, direct neurotransmitters that send messages from one brain area to the other. Uh, drugs like uh, memantine affect those types of systems. Then there are what are called the neuromodulators. They basically set the firing rate for broad networks of neurons. Uh, Chemicals such as norepinephrine, uh, dopamine, and serotonin are neuromodulators. 
When those nerve cells are dysregulated, what happens is that the patients develop things like Parkinson's disease or depression. Uh, in this slide, we see a, a representation of the brain stem. And here, the arrow points to the midbrain, where dopamine is produced, as opposed to here, uh, where the arrow points to the pons, where uh, the locus ceruleus is located and makes norepinephrine, and down here, the medulla, where uh, serotonin is produced. The third class of transmitter that we're not going to talk about today, but we will in a subsequent uh, uh, program, is what is referred to as trophic factors. Trophic factors promote growth, regeneration, and health of neurons. Things like nerve growth factor are trophic factors, and they may soon be used as treatments for certain types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease. All right, now that we've got the basic neuroanatomy down, let's talk a little bit about some of the diseases that can produce uh, confusion in your older resident. Let's begin with depression. First of all, depression is a common disorder, and you as a long-term care professional should be familiar with it. We know that up to 12% of nursing home residents may suffer from depression. We know that probably about 10% of the general aging population and as many as up to 25% of individuals with chronic severe health problems may suffer from depression. Therefore, we need to be familiar with the typical signs and symptoms associated with depression. We're all familiar with the classic symptoms that you expect to see, things like lowering of mood, sleep disturbance, loss of appetite, loss of energy, that sort of thing. But let's review, uh, as we see in this next graphic, some less commonly known but important symptoms. First of all, let's talk about somatization. Somatization means that the patient does not describe basic symptoms of depression, but rather produces a lot of physical complaints. Let me give you an example. This is that little old lady who whines all the time. She complains that her stomach hurts. Uh, and she's been to two or three gastroenterologists. She's had four endoscopies. No one can find anything wrong with this lady. And everybody's just frustrated with her. But let's listen carefully to this lady. What she says is, you know, doctor, my stomach hurts so bad that I don't sleep at night, that I don't care to eat. I'm not interested in anything anymore. I don't care if my family comes by. I feel like I'm a burden to them. And doctor, you know, if you can't fix this stomach pain, I might as well be dead. Now I ask you, what is the distinction between that and the classic symptoms of depression? And the answer is none, except that the, the somatic complaint is the ticket of entry into the healthcare system. Depressed elders oftentimes will not tell you that they're feeling down in the dumps and that they feel like giving up, because that's culturally not appropriate to them. So somatization can be an important, sometimes overlooked, symptom of depression. Other things include confusion. You can produce a uh, dementia-like syndrome in patients with depression. It's called depressive pseudodementia. Any patient who is confused needs an evaluation for depression. Weight loss. Your facility should look for depression in every patient who is losing weight. Uh, oftentimes, it's that they can't eat. It's that they won't eat. Other things include behavioral abnormalities. Uh, all, all of a sudden, if a patient becomes hostile, withdrawn, combative, one of the things that you need to exclude is depression. Remember, 25% of Alzheimer patients are going to become depressed. In fact, up to almost half of uh, Parkinsonian patients may have an episode of depression, and oftentimes it will be manifest as a behavioral change. And finally, psychosis. Anytime you're prescribing an antipsychotic, you should first ask, why is the patient hallucinating or delusional? And if, in fact, the patient is depressed, what you need to do is treat the depression while you treat the, anti while you treat the psychotic symptoms. Why am I, why am I uh, beating the depression drum so hard? Well, the, the reason is that 90% of these folks will get better if we just treat them effectively. All of the medications work pretty well. I can't recommend one particular drug over another, although I tend to use SSRI medications because they are particularly safe and effective. Remember, the common reasons why people don't get better with the antidepressant medications is inadequate dose and in inadequate duration of time. It takes six weeks to see the beneficial effect of an antidepressant medication. Why should you be concerned about treating this illness? Well, we know that individuals with depression who go untreated have higher rates of mortality and morbidity. For instance, if you have heart disease and depression, your risk of heart attack goes up, your risk of disability or death goes up, your risk of stroke goes up, your risk of uh, disability from the stroke goes up. If you're diabetic, your blood sugars go up. 
And we now know that uh, people who are depressed have an increased risk for developing dementia later on. Consequently, it is very, very important to look for and aggressively treat depression in the aging population. The second of the three Ds that we're going to talk about today is delirium. My colleague is going to discuss this as well, so consequently I'm only going to briefly touch on some of the signs and symptoms of delirium. It is, the t it is temporary confusion brought on by unrecognized medical problems or inappropriate medications. Why is delirium so important in the elderly? Because it's common. Studies show that up to 3% of nursing home residents are delirious at any point in time. We know that 15% of elders in medical units are delirious. And if you have a hip fracture, you have almost a 90% chance of developing delirium if you have Alzheimer's disease. So consequently, delirium is a problem, especially in individuals who are brain damaged. Delirium is commonly missed, especially in the emergency room. Missed delirium significantly increases morbidity and mortality for patients. If you go in a, a facility and don't understand, and the facility staff does not understand the typical symptoms of delirium, then there is a problem because their patients are going to have these kinds, they're going to have these kinds of symptoms. Why am I emphasizing delirium so much? Well, as you see in the next slide, the neuropathology of delirium is that there is no neuropathology. If you recognize it and treat it, the patients usually get better. Finally, let's talk about the last of the three Ds of confusion, and that's dementia. Dementia is the loss of multiple intellectual functions in the awake state. The next graphic demonstrates what demented brains look like. On the left is a normal brain, in the middle is a mid-stage brain, and on the right is an end-stage brain. On the next graphic, if we take a coronal section through these brains, left is uh, early, middle is middle, and right is uh, end-stage dementia. Dementia is the loss of multiple intellectual functions produced by the relentless death of brain cells. It is a dynamic disease. It changes over time. So consequently, not only do you have to assess the patients, but you have to reassess the patients over time to see where they, where they are uh, in their disease. In order to safely care for patients with dementia, you must have mastered the four A's of what I call Alzheimer's disease, amnesia, aphasia, apraxia, and agnosia. If you do not understand those four A's, and if the staff in the nursing home that you're in don't understand it, then you have a serious problem with your dementia uh, management program. There are two different kinds of symptoms that you'll see in a demented patient. There are the intellectual symptoms, which I'm going to talk about, which produce behavioral problems from cognitive loss. Those symptoms require behavior management according to the regulations and according to good care. On the other hand, there are psychiatric symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions which, do, which can be treated with appropriate psychotropic medications. Well, let's talk about the first and most common of the four A's. That's amnesia. Amnesia uh, is uh, memory problems. You have two kinds of memory circuits located in different regions, going back to that concept of compartmentalization. You have long-term memory, which is stored over neural networks, and you have short-term memory, which is located here in the hippocampus. The, the slide of this brain from the temporal lobe above represents a hippocampus as seen with the arrow. And down below, you'll see the hippocampus from a slice of temporal lobe from a person with Alzheimer's disease. Notice how much more dilated the ventricle is, as seen by this arrowhead, as opposed to the ventricle here in the normal up above here. The reason that that ventricle is dilated is because the hippocampus has died. Hippocampus processes recent uh, memory. So for instance, the way your brain is structured is uh, you have, it's sort of almost like your own PC. You have a workstation onto which you load information and you hold on to it for five or 10 minutes. And then you have a save button, which puts it into long-term memory. The workstation is located here in the hippocampus. When this part of the brain is damaged, people develop short-term recall problems. However, their long-term memory is left intact. Almost all Alzheimer patients develop short-term recall problems early in the disease. And that is a point at which you probably want to initiate therapy. As the disease progresses, as we see here in the next slide, wide areas of the temporal lobe are damaged and consequently long-term or older memories are lost as well. Remember, this is a progressive, relentless disease. Next, let's turn to language. There's two types of language function that you have to be familiar with. There is expressive language, my ability to speak to you, 
and there is receptive language, your ability to understand what I'm saying to you. Let's talk first about expressive language. There are many messages that you can send to somebody. There is the content of the speech, which I am saying, which I am saying to you. There is the emotion. If I, you can tell if I am happy or sad, even if you can't understand uh, what I am saying. There is the volume, how loud I am speaking to you. In, in some uh, neurological problems, the patients will actually speak in a loud, forceful voice when, in fact, they're not upset or angry. And then, of course, there is a cadence or prosody. I speak somewhat in a musical tone. On the other hand, some brain injuries will produce sort of an uneven way of speaking, which can sometimes be uh, distracting to the individual. You speak off the left side of your brain, and you curse, and you sing off the right side of your brain. So for instance, a person with a left-sided lesion uh, may not be able to speak to you, but they can cuss you out. It doesn't mean that they still have expressive language skills. It just simply means that the, that the, that the, uh, the speaking side of their brain is gone. As you can see in the next graphic that shows you uh, a right-sided uh, uh, damage produced by Alzheimer's disease as compared to the normal on the left. This is typical of the kind of frontal lobe injury that you see in Alzheimer's disease uh, that would produce some difficulty with speaking and then subsequently with swallowing and chewing. The second kind of language that you need to be familiar with is your receptive language. You have, as you see in the next slide, that demonstrates temporal lobes. You are listening to what I am saying here in the transverse temporal gyrus, and you are understanding what I am saying here in the superior temporal gyrus. Now, Alzheimer's disease is a disorder of the high order association cortex. In other words, the part of the brain that does your understanding. The part that does your hearing is not damaged by this disease. Oftentimes, you'll hear staff say to you, he hears just fine, he won't do what he's told. And of course, with Alzheimer's disease, that is partially true. He does hear fine. It does not cause the patient to become deaf. What happens, however, is that the understanding part of the brain is damaged and they no longer understand what you are saying to them. Receptive aphasia is, is very important because oftentimes it, uh, it goes unrecognized. The patients only uh, get every third or fourth word, but they do kind of understand what you're saying to them. They, but more importantly, they understand your body language, your tone of voice, and what's going on around them. So for instance, they may not understand what you're saying to them, but if you look frustrated or angry as you're trying to deal with them, they may uh, not understand the words, but they get, they get the attitude and the tone of voice, and they may become alarmed. So consequently, nonverbal communication with an Alzheimer patient is just as important as verbal communication with these individuals. So that's aphasia. Apraxia is the inability to do pre-programmed motor tasks. Everything that you've been taught through life, how to walk, how to talk, how to chew, how to swallow, those are all programmed somewhere in the brain. In the next slice, uh, here, we see on the left a normal brain, and on the right, the parietal lobe of an Alzheimer patient. This is the part of the brain that tells you where your arms are in three-dimensional space. It cues up your motor strip on what to do, for instance, if you're going to put on a shirt. Or even if you're going to walk, it tells you where your feet are underneath you. Consequently, when this part of the brain is damaged, even though you may want to put on your shirt, if you don't know where your hand is, or if you're struggling to understand where it is, you may not be able to put that shirt on. Now remember, the motor neurons that move your arms and your legs are still intact. So the patients retain their strength. They just forget how to do these very complex activities. In fact, typically what happens with the patient is the more complex activities, such as driving, uh, working, that sort of thing, are lost early. And then as the disease progresses, the simpler functions, such, such as uh, walking and uh, chewing and swallowing, are lost. Patients with gait apraxias uh, oftentimes look like they don't know how to use their feet. That's because the part of their brain that tells their feet where to move is damaged. However, they're still able to kick you and push you away with their feet. That's because the motor neurons that allow them to move their feet are still intact. Apraxias are very important to recognize. Once the patient loses that function, it probably is not coming back. Now, no two patients lose these functions in any particular pattern. So a patient may still be able to work certain things, like, for instance, the security system or the deadbolt system on the door, 
but may be unable to do simple things like brush their teeth uh, or pull their pants up. That's just the way the brain dies. It's not intentional behavior. That's, that's the result of the kind of alterations that you're seeing in these pictures. And finally, let's talk a little bit about agnosia. Agnosia is the inability to recognize previously learned sensory inputs. For instance, if you ever go into a room and there are some people in there that seem familiar, but you can't remember what their name is, that's because your occipital lobes are telling you, well, we think we know who they are, but we can't identify their name file. You remember how awkward that is, how unpleasant that is? Well, that's what it's like to have visual ag facial agnosias and to have Alzheimer's disease. They can also have tactile agnosias where they don't recognize the touch of things anymore. In the next slide, we see slices through the occipital lobe. On the left is a normal. On the far right is an advanced Alzheimer patient. This patient to the far right probably doesn't recognize anybody anymore. They may recognize a, a loving touch or the sound of a voice of a loved one, but they may not really recognize that facial uh, representation anymore. Uh, oftentimes, patients begin to lose uh, remembrance for the face of their caregiver, and that is particularly difficult for the caregiver. But unfortunately, that's just the way the brain is affected by the disease. So, what then are some common types of dementia that you may uh, need to deal with? Well, the more common types of dementia include Alzheimer's disease, which is, uh, is probably accounting for about 60% of all dementia in people over the age of 65. You've been told before that, by, in some instances, that vascular dementia is very common. In, in fact, pure vascular dementia is not as common as we think. Probably the second most common type of dementia in the elderly is diffuse Lewy body disease, uh, a disease that we may talk about at some future day. Post-traumatic dementia, individuals, younger individuals who have head injury, uh, frontotemporal dementia, and don't forget alcohol-induced dementia. These are the common dementias you'll see. All of the principles that we've just described to you today in this segment are applicable uh, in the management of any of these uh, brain disorders. Now, what I haven't talked about is many of the behavioral problems that you're going to see as a consequence of this cognitive loss, and I've not talked about the psychiatric manifestations either, simply because we don't have time today. Needless to say, about 75% of patients with dementia are going to develop some sort of psychiatric and behavioral problem that's going to need to be managed. We know that about a third of patients are going to become delusional, and probably about 25% of patients are going to develop either visual or auditory hallucinations that need to be appropriately managed. The most important part of this, though, is proper assessment. For instance, you don't want to treat somebody for hallucinations uh, if they're actually delirious or they have psychotic depression. You want to identify the delirium or the depression and treat that rather than putting them on an antipsychotic because you think that they have dementia with hallucinations or delusions, which then leads to the whole concept of, well, who needs to be knowledgeable? Who needs to know these facts in your workforce? And the answer is everybody. In our program, in my state and in Alabama, we have what's called an integrated multi-level educational program. The doctors need to understand, as well as the nurse practitioners and the physician's assistants, the basic causes, manifestations, and man management strategies for these diseases. The licensed professionals also have to be trained. I'm not just talking about the registered nurses and the social workers. I'm also talking about the physical therapists and the speech-language pathologists who are caring for your patients in your facility. They need to know all of the types of deficits and the management strategies for these individuals. Of course, the non-licensed professionals need to be trained, such as the CNAs. Your behavior management uh, program is only as good as the CNA who's trying to execute it at 2 o'clock in the morning with minimal supervision. In addition to that, you need to have a family education program so that when the CNAs are talking to the family or the nurses are talking to the family about Alzheimer's disease, they understand the natural history and progression of this disease, that it is a relentless progressive disease which will eventually disable and kill a patient. And finally, anybody who comes into your facility who uh, is going to manage one of your patients, for instance, if you're using a sitter program, they also need to have some basic information so that they can contribute to the overall care of this individual. So finally, what have we learned today? First of all, confusion is common in the long-term care setting. There's lots of knowledge that long-term care professionals need to master in order to take appropriate care of these individuals. 
in order to be safe in the management of these folks, you need to understand delirium, depression, and dementia. In dementia, you need to understand the four A's, amnesia, aphasia, apraxia, agnosia. You need to understand the behavioral problems produced by these intellectual losses and the best ways to manage them. Obviously, this is a mass of information that's beyond the scope of just this talk. If you want more information uh, that's uh, free and readily available, please go to our website, www.alzbrain.org. Thank you. And now Dr. Powers joins us in the studio. Good afternoon, Dr. Powers. Good afternoon. And thanks so much for being here today. Your presentation was very enlightening, and I think the slides of the brain um, and how it changes as dementia progresses are really dramatic. Uh, the pictures definitely help us to understand how and why behavior symptoms occur in many residents with dementia. Yeah, it, whenever I go out and give a talk to CNAs, and I, I talk to a lot of them, uh, they always say the same thing. He looks so healthy. Why is he acting like this? Why won't he do that? And I find that when, uh, and because the disease only afflicts the brain and they don't have other physical signs, oftentimes there's a lot of misunderstanding. And I find that the pictures really help the staff to understand that their brain is dying and they need to be treated with the consideration of somebody with a lethal disease. Mm. I guess this could be expected with such a complex topic. Uh, it appears that your presentation has raised some questions and I think we're going to start with Sharon over here. Sharon, your question. Thanks, Doris. Dr. Powers, you mentioned trophic factors is something that might be used in future treatment of dementia. What are trophic factors and what is their potential for the future? Well, there are many different ways that the brain sends messages from uh, one part to another or from one cell to another. And one of the most important that we're learning are these trophic factors. And what trophic factors are is molecules that promote the growth of uh, dendrites and axons. Those are the, the like the tree-like limbs that uh, sprout out from the neuron uh, and also promote uh, the connections between uh, called synapses. And we're, we're figuring out that, that synapses sort of predict how vulnerable you are to, to developing dementia. So anything you can do to promote the regeneration and the complexity of those synapses is helpful. There are medications that are, are being prepared to be released right now. One is nerve growth factor that we think may be helpful uh, in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I've got a question as well, uh, Dr. Powers. You know, I was wondering when you talked about short-term memory loss, I was wondering if I have it. I, I call them intellectual interludes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I lose my keys sometimes or um, I go into a room and I put something down. I can't remember why I went in there. Um, should I be worried that I'm getting what folks call old timers disease? Yeah, I get hit with that question all of the time. There's three different kinds of memory problems that a person can have. As we get older, not that you're getting older, but as, <laughs> as we get older, some of us get older, right. uh, uh, we become more forgetful. That's called age-associated memory impairment. We lose the ability to process large amounts of new information. It doesn't mean that we have uh, disease. It just means that we're getting a little bit older. There is this second entity that is now being studied extensively by scientists called mild cognitive impairment, where you have a significant memory problem but that's all you have. You don't have language or motor skill problems. Uh, the scientists believe that that may be a, a harbinger of dementia in the future. And then, of course, there's dementia. For instance, when you were 25 or 30 and you got sent to the store with a list of uh, 15 things and you didn't write it down, uh, you'd come back with maybe 12 or 13 and you knew you'd forgotten something. Mm -hmm. When you get to be 50, uh, <laughs> you know, you maybe come back with 10 or 11 and you're mad that you didn't write it down. <laughs> right. If you go to the store and come back with one or two, or forget why you went to the store, or forget where the store is, that's, uh, that's different, and that is an indicator for something like mild cognitive impairment. If that's the case, then you need to look into it a little further. Okay. To follow up on Doris's question, just how short is short-term memory? Is it just the remembering of a phone number you looked up for a few seconds, or is it remembering something for a few hours or a few days? Well, that's a good question, and it's, it's right sort of at the edge of how much we know about how the brain processes information. The pictures that were shown on the video of the hippocampus, that mm -hmm. sort of seahorse-shaped structure, that is where all new information must flow through in order to get into long-term memory. We don't really understand long-term memory particularly well. We can hold on to short-term memories for maybe five or ten minutes, and then unless we keep repeating it over and over,
and over again, it gets lost. Now, the other important thing to remember is that there are other things that can damage the hippocampus. For instance, if somebody has a cardiac arrest and their blood pressure and oxygen is low, or if they've been put on the bypass pump for vascular surgery and they had troubles on the pump and their pressures were low, the hippocampus is very sensitive to low blood pressure and low oxygen, and it's damaged easily, and they can also develop this sort of amnestic syndrome, but yet their long-term memory is relatively intact. For a resident with gait uh, praxia, where they forget how to use their feet, as you said, does this person tend to stand there and just stand still? Are they at risk for falling? Well, it would be a lot simpler if they did just stand there and stand still, but the reality is that oftentimes uh, they will try to walk. You know, Alzheimer patients like to wander, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it, it, it's sort of like if, if, if you're on rollerblades and, and you can't, don't know how to use them. That's what it feels like, and so consequently they, they feel unsteady, and you can see them when they stand up. They kind of sometimes rock back and forth. They don't know where to put their feet, uh, but then they will get going, and they are at risk for falls. And so consequently, the staff has to be very careful with those patients who are beginning to forget how to uh, walk. Likewise, they forget how to sit down. And you'll see patients trying to figure out how to get their body into the correct position to sit on a chair or on the commode. And so consequently, they need help rising and they need help sitting. With that being the case, do you have any suggestions of how staff should re respond to a resident with gait apraxia? Well, they should respond with great caution. They should know that these patients are at significant risk for falls. And so consequently, uh, they should uh, assist them when they're standing or they're sitting. Uh, they should assist them when they're walking if it seems like they're unsteady. Uh, if they are having trouble with falls, uh, then it is worthwhile to get a PT consult uh, to see if perhaps there's some other unrecognized motor problem that's being overlooked. Uh, and finally, you have to you have to treat them like every other fall patient. You have to do things like put hipsters on them. If they are falling and hitting their head, you have to put a helmet. Do everything you can to try to mitigate this risk for these patients. On the other hand, you don't want to tie them up. Uh, so they are going to get up, and, and sometimes despite your best efforts, they will fall. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just the, the balance of weighing the patient's rights and freedom against the potential risks. Eventually, they forget how to f completely how to walk, and then they become bed bound. Mm -hmm. What you said about delirium, uh, you said it should be ruled out. How would a surveyor tell that there might be a problem with unrecognized delirium? That's a very important uh, question. Uh, I think that when the surveyor uh, goes into a facility, they ought to ask basic questions like, you know, what happens if a patient comes back from the hospital and is severely confused? Oftentimes, your patients will come back from the hospital uh, and, and they will have a change in their cognitive status. You know, how do you look for that? How do you monitor the patients to see if they've had an abrupt change in either their intellectual or their psychiatric status? If that's the case, then, then they should have sort of a set evaluation that they do for those individuals. So a high index of suspicious, suspicion is very important in making sure, and the, and the staff should be able to tell you that, yeah, delirium is a big problem, and we watch for it. You also mentioned that the physician must distinguish psychotic symptoms from delirium. Would you say a little bit more about this determination? Yeah, oftentimes a patient will have a new onset of, uh, of hearing voices, seeing things, uh, having false beliefs, the staff is poisoning me, for instance. Uh, when that happens, the staff should have an evaluation that they do on those individuals. If it is an abrupt onset, then it's more likely to be delirium or some other neuropsychiatric problem. On the other hand, if it's a slow kind of grumbling process that slowly gets worse, like you know, two months ago you noticed that sometimes they seem to be hearing sounds or voices and, and now it's all the time and, and now they're refusing their medications because they think you're trying to poison them. Uh, when the, now that sounds more like psychosis associated with dementia. So the, the big thing is sort of the time uh, course with regards to the onset of psychotic symptoms. Whether you have psychosis associated with Alzheimer's disease or whether you have psychosis associated with delirium, the hallucinations and delusions oftentimes look, look the same. Uh, Dr. Powers, it looks like we have a question from one of our viewers. Uh, they'd like to know if you can give a practical example of the assessment and management of a delirious patient. Yes, every facility should have a standard protocol that it runs through whenever they think that the patient has had this abrupt change. 
there are many there are several common reasons why all patients become delirious but especially brain damaged not only patients with dementia but your traumatic brain injury uh, for instance unrecognized medical problems in uh, in uh, ladies with Alzheimer's disease uh, urinary tract infections will oftentimes bring on confusion mm -hmm. so for instance a uh, urinalysis should be considered a routine part of a delirium evaluation unrecognized other infections you got to remember for instance that Alzheimer patients can't tell you mm -hmm. that their chest hurts or their belly is bothering them so they need a good careful medical evaluation uh, inappropriate medications we know that there are certain drugs especially those medications that have a high anticholinergic profile uh, that have a very high risk of causing confusion so for instance if the patient was recently placed on amitriptyline uh, which is a very anticholinergic uh, antidepressant that may be the cause of the delirium sometimes it's simple things like a rectal impaction can cause a patient to stop eating get dehydrated and become confused or even things like environmental stimulation if you change the patient's room if you put a roommate in, in with them that screams all night and now they're not sleeping at night these are all the kinds of things that can cause it especially a demented person to become confused okay we have another question uh, this one is when a person loses the ability to do a certain action uh, like putting on their shirt is it permanently lost or does this vary in that they can do it sometimes and then not at others well initially what you have is you have good days and bad days where they can do some things they can bathe themselves they can dress themselves and but then on other days things are not quite so good and I always tell the families and the caregivers rejoice for the good days but don't expect them to remain good uh, eventually most of those functions <coughs> are uh, lost permanently the other question that I get asked all the time is well you know sometimes he does this one thing and it's really great Right. And why can't he do all these other things? And the answer is that's just the way the brain malfunctions. I mean, sometimes I can go out in my backyard and shoot two or three three-pointers. It doesn't make me into Michael Jordan, and you shouldn't expect me to go out for the NBA. And the same thing is with your patients, you know, that you have, to, you have to rejoice when they can do things, but mm -hmm. not expect them to be able to do them consistently. Dr. Powers, I have one more question for you. What about the diffuse Lewy body type of dementia you mentioned? What is it and how is it diagnosed? Yeah, diffuse Lewy body disease is probably going to be uh, the second or third most common cause of dementia in people over the age of 65. Uh, it has a completely different pathology than Alzheimer's disease and probably has a completely different genetics as well. Uh, instead of being uh, a disorder of uh, amyloid, this abnormal protein, it's a disorder of a different protein called synuclein. The key features of diffuse Lewy body disease are that they have dementia, they have intellectual loss that may look just like Alzheimer's disease. The second thing is uh, that oftentimes the intellectual impairment fluctuates, where some days they seem to be relatively with it and intact, and other days they really are quite confused. And the third thing is that oftentimes they'll experience visual hallucinations. Uh, with Alzheimer's disease, there's a kind of a predictable natural history where typically they get the memory problems and the intellectual problems first, and then two or three years later into the disease, they develop the psychiatric problems. With diffuse Lewy body disease, however, oftentimes they'll have only mild intellectual problems, and boom, all of a sudden they have the psychotic symptoms. Uh, now, is that foolproof? Can you go to the bank with that one? No. I mean, sometimes it's just impossible to distinguish the two. The other thing that you'll see in diffuse Lewy body disease is Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, they'll have, uh, you'll see dementia uh, in the setting of Parkinson's disease, or when you put them on the old antipsychotics, we call it the neuroleptic stress test, like uh, haloperidol, uh, they'll become very, very stiff. So when you have a patient who has fluctuating cognitive loss, visual hallucinations, and Parkinsonism, you ought to think about diffuse Lewy body disease. Does the person with this type of dementia present with different losses of functioning or different behaviors, or is the progression of the dementia different? Well, as I said before, what will happen is that sometimes they'll lead with the psychiatric problems. The other thing is that oftentimes they're mixed dementias, where people have both of them. They have both Alzheimer's disease and diffuse Lewy body disease. The reality is, though, that there, there's no absolute way to know exactly the cause of a person's dementia. And the only way to absolutely confirm it is with a post-mortem autopsy. Mm.
All right, thanks a lot, Dr. Powers. Uh, we're going to move forward with the broadcast now, but if anyone has any questions uh, remaining, please go ahead and call them in, and both of our doctors will be answering questions at the end of the show. Again, to call in your questions, you can dial 1-800-953-2233. If you'd like to fax in your questions, it's 1-410-786-0123. Again, to call in, 1-800-953-2233, and to fax, 1-410-786-0123. Uh, Dr. Powers gave us an in-depth look at many physical aspects of dementia, and now we've asked Dr. Cresilius as a medical director to cover issues arising from dementia-related behaviors. Dr. Cresilius is a clinical instructor in medicine at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, and the medical director of two nursing homes. A past president of the Missouri Association of Long-Term Care Physicians, he currently serves as a board member and chair of the Communications Committee for the American Medical Directors Association. He is a fellow in the American College of Physicians and a recipient of the Geriatric Recognition and Physicians Recognition Awards. He is on the board of directors of the Missouri End of Life Coalition and is a member of the American Geriatric Society, the American Association of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry. Dr. Cresilius maintains special interest in Alzheimer's disease, mood disorders, end of life care, and pain management. And now we're going to take a look at what he had to say. Thank you for inviting me today to talk about dementia-related behavior problems. Dementia-related behavior problems can cause real consternation for nursing homes. Inappropriately managed, they can cause demoralization of the staff and poor quality of life for the residents. Appropriately managed, they can cause a calm, quiet culture to the nursing home and improved resident quality of life. When we mention behaviors, there's a myriad of behaviors that can occur, as shown on the first slide. These behaviors are neither unique nor specific to any particular dementing illness. For example, with Lewy body dementia or Alzheimer's dementia, you can see any one of these behaviors. Furthermore, they're not specific to the stage of the dementia. These behaviors can occur in early onset, middle, and late onset Alzheimer's disease. So unfortunately, they can't tell us that much about what type of behavior or what type of dementia we're dealing with. They also don't suggest a specific intervention. One intervention will not work for every patient that wanders, for example. What we can learn, however, is that behaviors can be assessed, an etiology found, addressed, and appropriately managed, depending on the unique characteristics of that patient. People commonly ask, why do these behaviors occur? Well, they can be broadly defined into two categories of etiologies, intrinsic and extrinsic causes. Intrinsic causes are those that are unique to the patient. In other words, they really won't make a difference if the patient changes locations or circumstances. Extrinsic causes are more dependent upon the environment and circumstances the patient is put under. As shown in the next slide, intrinsic causes are multiple. The first and foremost would be brain damage itself. Dr. Powers has discussed how certain of these brain damaged areas can promote certain behaviors. For example, frontal lobe damage and intrinsic or uh, disinhibited behavioral problems. These, however, aren't always fully explanatory of the nature of the problem. Because dementing illnesses can affect the multiple areas of the brain, and because there's other factors involved, we can't always say a certain behavior predicts a certain area of brain involvement. Comorbid diseases play a very important role in behavioral manifestations, especially psychiatric conditions, delirium, and serious comorbid medical problems. The presence of psychoses, severe depression, anxiety, and neurosis can greatly magnify behavioral problems. Acute illnesses such as pneumonias and urinary tract infections can similarly magnify problems. It's important to acknowledge and address these problems and treat them appropriately. Medications that we use can also have an effect on the patient's behavior. Unfortunately, many of the medicines used to treat behavioral problems can sometimes work against us. We have to carefully titrate these medicines to determine whether they have a beneficial or deleterious effect on the behavior. This can normally be done by falling longitudinally with time to correlate behaviors with medication changes. This obviously necessitates a good tracking mechanism that somebody is responsible for. Other medical issues that can cause problems include things as simple as visual loss. A patient who's having visual hallucinations may have a primary psychosis. They may, however, only have visual misrepresentations caused by things such as senile macular degeneration and cataracts and dementia that makes them unable to 
understand or interpret what they're actually seeing. Close inspection is required to determine what the exact cause is. Pain is a particularly notorious behavior aggravating effect, especially in moderate or severely demented patients. Recent studies suggest that in demented patients of severity sufficient that they can no longer communicate, the empiric trials of Tylenol can be used to modulate the behavior. One study suggested a one-third to one-half improvement in behavior in, such the, in these such patients. These studies have not been widely replicated, so it can't be tried empirically necessarily to everybody, but we should have a th high threshold for determining whether pain could be a factor in the patient's aggravated behavior. Other physical needs, hunger, for example, or unmet toileting needs can drive behaviors. We need to make sure that CNAs and staff understand this and regularly assess patients for these needs. And now let's talk about extrinsic factors. Extrinsic factors, again, are those that aren't really unique to the patient but depend heavily upon the circumstances under which the patient's put in. Environmental factors are common. We're all aware that noisy environments, say around change of shift, can really drive bad behavior. We need to make sure we can modulate the noise level and make it appropriate for the patient. This doesn't mean that noisy environments are always inappropriate. Planned noise, such as music therapy, can be very beneficial. Similarly, lighting levels are important. There's been evidence that suggests that bright light therapy can be very helpful for people that sundown. On the other hand, bright light is no longer appropriate, obviously, for people that are trying to sleep. We again have to individualize it to the patient's needs. We need to provide enough space for patients. Some patients like to wander. If the environment doesn't let them wander successfully, they're going to become agitated. And correspondingly, we have patients that need tight social knit structures. They don't want to be in wide open spaces. They may not like these newer designs where there's more space involved. They may want to sit at the nurse's station despite some common thoughts these days. We need to meet those people's needs too and recognize their desires. Social extrinsic factors are also very important. It's appropriate that we make these social activities meet the patient's individual needs. They need to be culturally and cognitively specific to the patient. If we have activities that are too simplistic, they're demeaning to the patient. If we have activities that are too beyond them, we'll simply frustrate them. We need to provide an appropriate amount of social activities. We all need rest periods. We need to make sure that the families are involved. Families often leave town or won't be there for a while, and we need to make sure we have ways to correct this. Patients will often ask where their family is. Do we have cards, letters, videotapes? Can we reach them by phone? Factors such as these are important in understanding why behaviors arise. Lastly, the staff. And I shouldn't say lastly because they may be the first and foremost. CNA training and education along with other staff member education is absolutely important as a goal to diminish adverse behavior. It's better to have one well-trained staff member than three that don't know what they're doing. One well-trained staff member can dissuade and distract several people simultaneously whereas three or four poorly trained people may do nothing but cause a lot of aggravation and worsening behavior. We need to continually train people and update them. This is an ongoing field with new information arising. It's not a static field. We can learn from ourselves and learn from other homes. Let's go now from the etiologies of behavior to approaches to behavior. There is no one behavior system that's been shown to be superior to another. There's a wide variety of behavior interventions we could undertake and still not find them all or try them all. We can broadly divide these, divide these categories into pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions. Pharmacologic interventions are beyond the scope of today's talk and will be addressed in more detail in a later webcast. I do for now, however, want to touch on four areas in which pharmacologic management is very important and should not be overlooked. These four areas are shown in the following slide. First, violent behavior that is not redirectable. When a resident picks up a knife and threatens another resident, it's appropriate to rapidly try and redirect them, and if it can't quickly and successfully be done, to not be afraid to use the appropriate pharmacotherapy. In the interim, we search for other root causes and try and find why the patient is doing this. Secondly, distressing hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia are often signs of a primary psychosis. As Dr. Powers pointed out, primary psychoses normally need medication to be successfully dealt with. If we ignore these behaviors, we can cause drastic problems. This isn't to say that every minor little annoyance or delusion necessarily needs to be treated. Many Alzheimer's patients in nursing homes don't know where they are. That doesn't mean that they're deluded and need 
pharmacotherapy. It depends on how distressing it is to the patient and others around them. Thirdly, abrupt worsening behavior that can be ascribed to an acute change in mental or physical condition. For example, a moderately demented Alzheimer's patient that develops a urinary tract infection or a pneumonia and becomes abruptly psychotic. We need to identify and treat the root cause, the infection, but in the meantime, we need to provide for the patient's safety and comfort along with the staff and other residents' safety by treating those conditions urgently. Lastly, depression that has an acute change or functional decline needs to be treated urgently. Of course, we're going to use antidepressants to treat the depression, but sometimes people decline so rapidly, develop such severe psychoses, or lose weight so rapidly that we need to use stronger medications in order to treat these people. Acknowledging these four our primary conditions under which we would normally use pharmacotherapy, let's move now to the focus of this talk, that is, non-pharmacologic management of behavior problems. As I've said, there's a variety of techniques you can use, and today we don't have enough time to discuss them all. What we can discuss is the common approaches they all employ. There's basically five approaches to managing behavior non-pharmacologically. The first, define the behavior it's very important to know what behavior we're talking about. It's unfortunately not uncommon to find different staff talking about different behavior and all lumping it under the term agitation. Agitation is a fine shorthand term to use in the chart here and there, but somewhere the, the behavior has to be far more specified so we know what we're tracking. What does it involve? What sets it off? Who's involved? What happens afterwards? How often does it occur, importantly, are very important elements that define a behavior. Second of all, we have to figure out whether the problem is really a problem. What's the extent and nature of the problem? Sort of a scope and severity determination. Some problems aren't really all that problematic for most of the team. For example, the amorous couple in the nursing home that discovers each other and starts to take to each other in an intimate fashion. This can be horribly distressing for the family who comes in and finds their spouse cheating on each other, as it were. Well, we know they're not necessarily cheating. They're simply demented and no longer acknowledge that they're married. There's several possible solutions for this. First of all, explain to the family what's going on. Have them realize it's not a matter that the spouse is cheating. It's more a matter that simply the man is demented, the woman's demented, and can no longer control their impulses. We can also arrange for one family visit to have the couple separated. Simple solutions sometimes take care of simple problems that affect only a small number of people. The next step commonly used in strategies involves defining certain triggers. Sometimes we can find exactly what's provoking a problem and address it. For example, Mrs. Jones may hate a bath from a particular aid. On the other hand, she may love it from another aid that works in the next shift. We have to adapt our schedule to meet that patient's needs. Unfortunately, sometimes triggers can't be found or are relatively vague. So we can't expect to find a unique trigger for every situation. If we don't look, however, we won't find it. Determining triggers often involves the active involvement of the CNAs. If we ignore their input into the team, we're really going to miss the ability to find those things that set off certain behaviors. After we've taken these three initial steps, the next phase is to implement an intervention. Interventions can be varied, and we're going to talk about them in more detail. For now, I want to focus on the fact that we have to set first realistic goals. Most interventions won't cure a problem all the time. You may occasionally find a resident, I have one for example, who can be constantly dissuaded by simply putting on her favorite musical. Every time she acts out, the sound of music goes on and she's happy for the next half hour. Unfortunately, all too often, we find the interventions are only partially successful. If we set realistic goals, such as a 50% reduction in behavior over the next two to four weeks with our interventions, we're far less likely to discourage the staff, cause staff turnover, forget that behavior management can be effective, and over-rely on pharmacotherapy. We need to anticipate possible complications of our interventions. An example would be the person that self-stimulates themselves during television programs that are highly suggestive. Unfortunately, these are ubiquitous these days, and it's hard to find programming on television that won't occasionally arouse the sexual interest of a person. This person could ideally be taken to the room where they can meet their needs privately and away from others, not causing a distraction or a commotion to others. The unfortunate side effects of this may be that the man or woman may eventually try and get out of their chair and fall. 
We may have to anticipate this and leave an attendant nearby in the room in order to prevent the subsequent consequences. Finally, we need to reevaluate re and redesign as necessary. We need to establish a frequency of monitoring. Is it a daily behavior log we use? Is it a team that meets weekly? Typically, it's a combination of both. Who's on the team is very important. While typically we need somebody in charge, for example, the floor charge nurse, we drastically need the input of all members of the team. If we don't get the CNA's buy-in, the behavior intervention will never work. Teams often are just composed of the CNA and floor nurse, but they can involve a larger team. Ideally, the medical director, the attending physician, recreation therapist, and others should be involved. This is especially true in implementation. I've alluded to the CNA's importance in this process. We can't forget the other staff members, the people that work in the kitchen, the housekeepers, the administrators. Everybody has to have an understanding of the basic principles. And it really goes beyond basic principles. For especially problematic patients, the whole building needs to know what behaviors work for that individual. When Mrs. Jones heads to the door, does the front receptionist understand what to do? When somebody tries to barge into the kitchen inappropriately, do the staff know what to do there and how to redirect that patient? Unless we involve all members of the team as appropriate for individual patients, we'll be met with a lack of success. This general outline I've just gone through is typified in a number of clinical practice guidelines. I'd like to refer you in particular to the American Medical Director Association, or AMDA's clinical practice guidelines. These clinical practice guidelines are not prescriptive. They don't go into great detail about medications or exactly what to do. Rather, they outline general features of a behavior intervention on how they can be implemented. When we talk about behavior interventions, the ones that are most applicable are those on dementia, delirium, and acute changing condition. We've talked about general approaches to behavior problems. I'd like to now talk more specifically about detailed problem-solving strategies that can be utilized to implement behavior modification. There are some general principles as shown on the next slide. First, most, first and foremost, early intervention. We can't let problems lay around. The whole team, again, has to know what to do and initiate interventions promptly. If Mrs. Jones is left screaming in the hallway for 30 minutes, behavior interventions aren't going to work. Early intervention doesn't always mean we need to overreact to problems. For some behaviors, relative passive approaches or temporary ignoring of a problem, if planned, may be the right intervention. Second, we need to avoid confrontation. The majority of Alzheimer's patients enjoy a calm, collected approach that helps to redirect, redirect and distract them. Confrontational approaches rarely work. Having said this, we will occasionally find a patient that does well with a very boisterous, loud approach but this needs to be individually planned to meet that patient's needs and not the need of the person giving the behavior intervention. We need to control excess stimulation. And again, we need stimulation in nursing homes. You can both promote and destroy good behavior by having too much or too little stimulation. Music therapy is a good example. If it's done correctly, we stimulate people, they enjoy themselves. On the other hand, if we have random acts of music throughout the building where radio stations are on that don't meet the cultural needs of the patient, we may bring about unwanted behavior. Control is the key word here. Fourth, we need to distract and redirect. This is a keystone of dealing with demented patients. We can utilize their short-term memory loss to our advantage. An example is the woman that constantly wants to go home. When can I go home? When can I leave? Who's going to pick me up? Distraction techniques involved. Tell me about your homes, Mrs. Jones. Who lived there? Did you have pets? How long did you live in that house? Redirect them slowly to general subjects about house and get them off the desire to go home. This will work for short periods of time, and admittedly, the patient's going to again bring up the subject of going home. But temporary respites are very important in behavior management. Again, we can't expect complete resolution of behaviors. We can expect a diminution of behaviors and help promote less reliance on pharmacotherapy. Lastly, we need to provide dignity. We all like to feel we're being respected. Disrespect towards patients cannot be tolerated. A good example is humor. There's a fine line between appropriate humor and inappropriate humor. Some patients are cognizant of their memory loss and, and can accept and joke about it. It's not all that uncommon to hear a CNA joke with one of the residents 
I don't know whose memory is worse today, yours or mine, when they're having a bad day. And some residents accept this very well, laugh about it, and gain a uh, bonding with the CNA. Certainly other residents will react violently to this sort of humor. It's important to know individually what that patient can tolerate. If we don't know their thresholds, we don't know whether we're going to cross that fine line that insults dignity. We can now talk about more specific interventions. Interventions can be broadly divided into therapeutic interventions and into control mechanisms. We're familiar with therapeutic interventions. The ones I've listed basically can be utilized and combined together or used separately. Music therapy, for example, is often used socially to uh, help modify behavior and redirect patients from unpleasant activities. It can also be used on an individual basis. For example, the patient that yells out and hollers in the chair for no discernible reason. That patient may sometimes respond to headphones put on to redirect them and provide pleasant music. It won't work all the time, and just because it fails once, it shouldn't be um, given up upon. Music therapy can be used, but it must be culturally specific to the patient. Loud, current music may be totally inappropriate for certain patients. Other patients may enjoy it. It's a matter of testing the waters and finding out what that patient wants. Sensory therapy can be highly utilized to control behavior. Many patients can be redirected, for example, by offering a therapeutic massage. Many of our patients have aches and pains, and massage therapy may help alleviate that pain and distract them from the problem they perceive at hand. Aromatherapy has been promoted to help promote better behavior in nursing homes. Certain floral scents have evidence to suggest that they help diminish the average extent and frequency of behaviors. This is a relatively new field, but can certainly be used as an attempt to diminish behavior problems in certain selected residents. Other sensory therapies could involve, for example, looking at pictures. There's any number of ways to stimulate our senses and redirect behavior. Reminiscent therapy is a mainstay of redirection techniques. Because people's long-term memory tends to stay intact until the very last stages of dementia, we can utilize our past experiences to bring about pleasurable experiences and distract them away from the unpleasant experiences they're having. Reminiscent therapy takes many forms. Some of the examples I've already given use reminiscent therapy. Many homes have memory boxes embedded in the wall in which their possessions are placed there and they can be brought to it and reviewed it. Perhaps more practical is a memory box. It can be either individually or group-based. It can be kept at the nurse's station or the bedside and brought out when the patient's agitated, upset, or having some behavioral problem. Rummaging through it may give them something to do. It redirects them and makes them think about more pleasant times and places. Often music therapy involves reminiscing. Name that tomb type games. In addition to reminiscent therapy, we go into social therapy, which often are combined. Social therapy, again, has to be appropriate for the patient. It has to be culturally and cognitively specific. Having a cooking class for 80-year-old gentlemen may not be appropriate. All the women may enjoy it, but the men may wonder what in the world they're doing. They never did this before in their life. Trying to take group activities and break them down into individuals' needs may help solve this problem. Sponsoring a cooking contest, for example, may work. The men can help uh, reduce flyers, set up tables, advertise the event, get people to come to it. They can be the judges. There's any number of structured activities you can take and make certain that each member can participate in it. This doesn't mean that social activities have to be for everybody. Some people won't enjoy the social activity and this should be anticipated and they should be redirected to another area of the building and provided some alternative means of activity. Field trips should not be ignored. Some of the best nursing homes I know have some of the most adventuresome field trips. People need controlled stimulation as we talked about and many field trips can utilize this to their benefit. It can be a confined social event, combined social event, reminiscent event, and a new experience. Just because people have dementia doesn't mean they can't handle relatively new situations or situations they haven't experienced in a while. The key is having a somewhat adventurous, imaginative approach to behavior interventions, trying it out cautiously and seeing who it works on and who it doesn't work on. Control mechanisms are commonly employed by nursing homes. Contextual control is probably the oldest. That is, putting things into context for the patient. Aides know this technique, or at least the good ones do, explaining to the patient what they're going to do before they do it. Mrs. Jones, I need to wash you because you've gotten dirty. 
as a doctor, if I don't explain to a demented patient what I'm about to do when I put my stethoscope over the heart, I'm likely to get hit. Explaining to the patient where they are and what's going on in the immediacy of the situation is important. It's far more important than telling them what day and date it is. Those have little role or bearing, especially for people that are moderately severely demented. Consequential mechanisms are commonly used in nursing homes. We have to be careful with consequential mechanisms. It's fine to give positive rewards for positive behaviors. However, we have to be careful about using negative rewards for negative behaviors. Preferred is simply to give an absence of a response for a negative behavior. The patient that bird dogs the nurse constantly wanting attention. The nurse shouldn't just tell the patient, shut up, go away, leave me alone. It's better to sort of ignore that patient, redirect them here and there. When the patient's quiet, give them positive reinforcement. There's a variety of techniques that can be used in this fashion. Importantly, we have to be careful and not cross that line of punishing a patient or having the appearance of doing so. Stimulus control involves promoting an acceptable level of stimulation and stress that the patient can accept. Everyone has a stress threshold over which you cross you don't operate as well. For some people, it's very low, and that tends to represent a good number of Alzheimer's patients. If they have an unacceptable level of stress, noise, lighting, other forms of stimulation, they're far more likely to experience adverse behaviors. Working to keep a stress threshold for a variety of people that have a variety of stress holds requires a lot of thought and imagination, but it can be done. Behavior problems at end of life pose their own unique challenge. End of life situations often involve a lot of compromise. First, the four A's worsen. Amnesia, agnosia, apraxia, all worsen. The patient may not be able to walk as well, may not be able to talk and communicate. That leads to a lot of restrictions on what interventions we can use. Reminiscent therapy that depends on long-term memory may no longer be applicable to a patient who's demented and doesn't even know where they are or where they've been, doesn't remember their age or where they were born. Instead, we may have to, to rely more on simple sensory mechanisms or music mechanisms. We have to be concerned about concomitant diseases. People approaching end of life often become seriously depressed, and we have to acknowledge this and make sure we've triaged that and addressed that issue. Similarly, people towards end of life commonly develop other comorbid diseases and may become delirious. We have to be careful and use low doses of pharmacologic agents not to worsen the delirium. Finally, the goals of care change. We tend to approach more palliative goals. And then we run into problems with defining are we helping or hurting the patient. The patient in pain with dementia may not be able to tolerate doses of opioids very well. What do we titrate to? Do we titrate to relief of pain and accept the sedation that remains? People that lose the ability to walk, they become very upset over this, try and get up out of the chair continuously. What do we do with that person? Do we put them in jerry chairs and accept the risk of falls? Do we walk with them and accept a limited range of mobility? There's no definite answer. It brings up the key to modifying behaviors at all stages of life, communication and education. We need to educate ourselves, the families, the team, about what we can and can't do. We need to acknowledge it is an end-stage disease that will have limits. We need to communicate this well throughout the team so everybody is on the same page at the same time. Thank you for your attention today. All right, and uh, Dr. Cresselius is back here in the studio with us. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for uh, your presentation. Uh, it's great to hear of the many tools a nursing home can use to alleviate symptoms that are distressing uh, to their residents with dementia. You're most welcome, Doris. I really cr enjoyed creating that section for you. I believe nursing home staff can collaborate with the medical director and work as a team to try and find the most optimal methods to help their patients who are having behavioral difficulties such as I discussed. The best care plan will only be as effective as the staff members who are carrying it out day by day. All right, well, we have some questions about your presentation, and Sharon, I know you want to start off. Thanks. Dr. Cresselius, you mentioned there should be some sort of tracking mechanism for the facility to track the resident's response to medication changes. What information do you like your facilities to present to you as you're making changes in antipsychotic medications? Well, there's basically two types of information I want. One is written communication that's logged and permanent in the MAR, for example, or a behavior log. So when I go to the facility, I can find that information. It's in the record forever. I can look at what the patient was like last week, last month, see if behavioral changes I've made or pharmacologic changes have had an impact. 
Second, though, I do need to speak to the staff there at that time. The written record can't substitute for the person's own assessment. There are things that are hard to put down in a log. I want to know their assessment of that day, what they're seeing longitudinally, and it's not just the staff I need to speak to. Ideally, I'm going to speak to family and get their input. It's very important to make sure those terms are well defined. Agitation is too big of an umbrella term. We really can't just talk about agitation. Does that mean hitting somebody? Does that mean picking up a chair and moving around? Is it screaming at the top of your lungs? That record needs to be specific that we keep in the log so that each staff member, each shift from day to day knows exactly what behaviors we're talking about. You discussed that there should be uh, stimulation, but not too much stimulation. What does some but not too much simulation look like? I'm thinking about um, public address systems, radio playing, and other random noise, as well as intentional sounds. Are there differences based on the type of stimulation, such as auditory or physical or tactile stimulation? Well, I think when we talk about stimulation, a key word is anticipate. If we can anticipate something, we're going to react favorably to it. For example, if I'm on a construction site and I hear a jackhammer starting off, I'm not going to be too surprised. If I'm here now in the studio or in a nursing home and all of a sudden a jackhammer goes off, I'm going to be ducking under tables. Mm -hmm. And why do we expect our residents to act any differently? Loud, unanticipated noise is going to get a bad response. Sometimes around change of shift, we see a lot of this sort of noise. Sometimes, even well-intended, we see more noise than we'd like to see. Dining rooms may get too noisy with clashing of plates, for example. Uh, late in the evening, as people are being put to bed, some of the staff may be relatively loud and ab abrupt in their noise instead of having a calm and reassuring approach. It's hard to train staff and to always remember ourselves as we're in the facility, but am I anticipating the residents' response or am I anticipating my own response in providing stimulation? Okay. Dr. Crusoe, uh, we have another facts question. It says, I'm wondering about depression. Uh, how can one differentiate depression from dementia-related behavior problems, and what's the role of the psychiatrist in dealing with behaviors? Those are two separate issues, really, of course. Uh, when it comes to depression and dementia, we have to realize that they really often coexist. Many times we're dealing with demented patients who have become depressed. So it's hard to segregate out a particular behavior and say it's due to dementia or it's due to depression. What we can say are those some generalities. Uh, vegetative symptoms such as sleep disturbance and appetite disturbance tend to be more characteristic of depression. When somebody subacutely or abruptly starts losing weight as a change in their sleep pattern, it's more likely to represent depression. Some symptoms such as loss of concentration, lack of energy are a little less specific for depression. Uh, suicidal thoughts or reference to death may also uh, lend a little more credence to depression. Mm -hmm. For some of our end-stage dementia patients, it gets very difficult to sort out what the symptoms are. And at times, only a trial of a therapeutic agent, an antidepressant, uh, may really tell us what the symptoms are relating to, whether it's a depressive or dementia-related symptom. If a resident has lost their words, which is also called expressive aphasia, and they're anxious and trying to tell you something, does it help if you supply the word that they're searching for? I mean, can they recognize your word as the one that they were trying to find? That really depends. There's so many different types of patients. In general, it's okay to try to give a word. At. For many people, they may be able to understand that. For some people, however, they not only have a expressive component, they have a receptive component, and they may not understand fully the words that you're saying. Therefore, all you can do is try and give a short phrase. It's important to realize these people respond not just to verbal cues, but to physical cues. So many times, if we're asking about an ache or a pain, just having a pained expression on our face and pointing to the location may be adequate to get a response. Is there pain in your shoulder? So remembering that the patient communicates in many different ways is very helpful. Uh, Dr. Vasilis, we have another question. Uh, could you give some ideas for dealing with specific behavioral problems, say screaming, for instance? The screaming or vocal disruptors is the probably correct term to use. Mm -hmm is unfortunately one of the most difficult behaviors to manage. There is no wonder drug. Nothing really works that well unless you can identify a root cause. Probably the first thing we should always look for is in pain, not just with screaming, but with any symptom. Is it at all possible that the patient is attempting to communicate pain? If so, an empiric trial of a low-dose pain medicine or a low-dose pain medicine mixed with an opioid, for example, may be appropriate. There's a lot, of been, a lot of other methods been tried. None are really um, 
good enough to recommend uniformly. Many people use headphone sets to try and determine whether music may help redirect them, uh, segregating those patients away. Uh, for the other residents' rights, making sure those patients are put into rooms with roommates that can tolerate that noise level. Uh, quite practically speaking, a roommate that's deaf or has severe hearing problems would be the appropriate roommate for that patient. Mm. Uh, I have a, one final question. When using the team approach that you advocate, who's responsible for behavior management? I don't want to give you a cyclic argument, but the fact is it is a team approach. Mm -hmm. If you want me to name any one person, I'd have to say it's the CNA, which some people may not believe, but frankly, they're the ones that gather the information, give it back to the team, and they're the ones that apply the information. You can look at the physician as a medical consultant of sorts. He comes in or she comes in, assesses the information given, provides pharmacologic approaches and some behavioral approaches. If you have a geriatric psychiatrist, to get back to one of our other questions, that person also serves as a consultative role for especially difficult cases in particular. You have the nurse is really sort of the coordinator, the quarterback for the team. It helps gather the information from various sources, puts it together, writes a care plan. But as I already said, a care plan is only as good as the people that apply it. And the first line workers are always the CNAs. All right. I'd like to thank you for uh, your answers to all the good questions that we had. And now I'd like to take a moment to address a question uh, for both of our doctors here. Uh, dementia in the popular press. Uh, I know that everyone here has seen articles and studies that have received significant play in the media recently, uh, such as the Nun study occurring with the sisters at Notre Dame, uh, as well as others. In fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, a report was televised that women taking hormone replacement medications may increase their risk for developing dementias. So I'd like to ask you all if you would enlighten us on what we're hearing in the popular press and uh, tell us what's true and what's worthwhile. Well. There's a lot of good news on dementia based on research. Uh, first of all, uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Bill Marksbury, was the, really the primary investigator on the, the Nun study that followed a group of uh, sisters from the Midwest uh, and was able to actually not only see what happened to them in late life, but also to judge the level of their academic and intellectual achievement as young people. And what they found was that lifetime intellectual achievement seems to be somewhat protective against the onset of, of Alzheimer's disease. The second thing that they found was that there were some sisters who died who were intellectually intact who had all of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so just because you have the brain changes doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to become demented. The third thing that they figured out was that some of the uh, blood vessel changes, the vascular changes that occur in the brain may actually be as predictive of intellectual loss as the uh, Alzheimer type changes which are quite distinctive. So where does that leave us? Well what it leaves us with is a new sense that w behavioral problems, say screaming for instance. The screaming or vocal disruptors is the probably correct term to use mm -hmm. is unfortunately one of the most difficult behaviors to manage. There is no wonder drug, nothing really works that well unless you can identify a root cause. Probably the first thing we should always look for is in pain, not just with screaming, but with any symptom. Is it at all possible that the patient is attempting to communicate pain? If so, an empiric trial of a low-dose pain medicine or a low-dose pain medicine mixed with an opioid, for example, may be appropriate. There's a lot of, been, a lot of other methods been tried. None are really um, good enough to recommend uniformly. Many people use headphone sets to try and determine whether music may help redirect them, uh, segregating those patients away. Uh, for the other residents' rights, making sure those patients are put into rooms with roommates that can tolerate that noise level. Uh, quite practically speaking, a roommate that's deaf or has severe hearing problems would be the appropriate roommate for that patient. Mm. Uh, I have a, one final question. When using the team approach that you advocate, who's responsible for behavior management? I don't want to give you a cyclic argument, but the fact is it is a team approach. Mm. If you want me to name any one person, I'd have to say it's the CNA, which some people may not believe, but frankly, they're the ones that gather the information, give it back to the team, and they're the ones that apply the information. You can look at the physician as a medical consultant of sorts. He comes in or she comes in, assesses the information given, provides pharmacologic approaches and some behavioral approaches. If you have a geriatric psychiatrist, to get back to one of our other questions, that person also serves as a consultative role for especially difficult cases in particular. You have the nurse is really sort of the coordinator, the quarterback for the team. 
that helps gather the information from various sources, puts it together, writes a care plan. But as I've already said, a care plan is only as good as the people that apply it. And the first line workers are always the CNAs. All right. I'd like to thank you for uh, your answers to all the good questions that we had. And I'd like to take a moment to address a question uh, for both of our doctors here. Uh, dementia in the popular press. Uh, I know that everyone here has seen articles and studies that have received significant play in the media recently, uh, such as the Nun study occurring with the sisters at Notre Dame, uh, as well as others. In fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, a report was televised that women taking hormone replacement medications may increase their risk for developing dementias. So I'd like to ask you all if you would enlighten us on what we're hearing in the popular press and uh, tell us what's true and what's worthwhile. Well. There's a lot of good news on dementia based on research. Uh, first of all, uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Bill Marksbury, was the, really the primary investigator on the, the Nun study that followed a group of uh, sisters from the Midwest uh, and was able to actually not only see what happened to them in late life, but also to judge the level of their academic and intellectual achievement as young people. And what they found was that lifetime intellectual achievement seems to be somewhat protective against the onset of, of Alzheimer's disease. The second thing that they found was that there were some sisters who died who were intellectually intact who had all of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so just because you have the brain changes doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to become demented. The third thing that they figured out was that some of the uh, blood vessel changes, the vascular changes that occur in the brain, may actually be as predictive of intellectual loss as the uh, Alzheimer type changes, which are quite distinctive. So where does that leave us? Well, what it leaves us with is a new sense that w what you go into later life with may somehow predetermine uh, wh what sort of intellectual loss you're at risk for. So, for instance, the newer research that's coming out, based on this older research, suggests that people who have an active intellectual, physical, act, intellectual, and spiritual life may have a diminished risk for uh, developing Alzheimer's and different other types of dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that if you have high blood pressure, uh, every study that has been done shows that if you have high blood pressure and you do not manage it, your risk of developing intellectual loss as you grow older goes up. So the good news is now that there are things that we can begin to do when we're 40 or 50 that may somehow affect our risk for developing dementia later on in life. Okay. Um, Dr. Grisellis, would you like to add any? I'd just say that that concept of cognitive reserve still works even when you're in the nursing home. We see the better our, uh, care units, Alzheimer's units, often having uh, very active recreation therapy programs, mm -hmm. programs that stimulate the person's mind, that prevents boredom, that keeps a person from simply wasting and sitting. I think it's a, an applied method of the same philosophy. All righty. Well, it's um, certainly interesting to hear the kinds of studies that are going on now. Uh, and what kind of impact they're having. You know, we've gotten a few more questions as the show's been running, so we're going to see if we can get some answers to those now. Uh, this is a question for both of you. Uh, neither of you discussed the stages of dementia, but in the past, uh, others have described dementia in terms of stages and what losses were at each stage. Um, is the concept of stages no longer used? Well, I think it's still helpful to have some simple staging mechanism in traditionally we've talked about mild, moderate, and severe dementia. There's been a lot more refinements of that. For practical purposes, we often talk about functional losses, and that may really predispose better to an accurate system of classification than simply looking at cognition. A score in a minimal status exam, for example, may not be as important as an activity of daily living scale. So the scales are getting refined. In general, we're seeing a little bit more input into this aspect. What is the uh, clinical dementia rating, for example, is one scale. I think as time goes on, we'll see more emphasis on that aspect, what's really the person's functionality, not just what is their cognition. Okay. Would you like to add anything, Dr. Yeah, I think it is important to remember that this is a progressive disease and that, and that new deficits occur, so we have to reassess them. Just because you assess them once doesn't mean that you just forget about it. You have mm -hmm. to reassess them. Typically, it's on an annual basis. The other issue with regards to staging, probably as more and more medications come online that slow the progress of the disease at different stages, like, for instance, the new drug, Mamantine, 
uh, uh, slows middle stages more than it does early stages based on available data, mm -hmm. then you're going to have more emphasis also on making sure that you keep track of what level they are at. So I think it's going to be a bigger issue, not a smaller issue. Okay. All right. Um, just to follow up on the nun study, that was kind of fascinating. Um, what were the ages of the nuns that we were talking about? Well, when they were, what, uh, God bless the Catholic Church, they mm -hmm. keep records forever. I'm Catholic, I okay. would say that. And, uh, and when you joined the, the, the sisters, you had to write a, a paragraph as to why it was that you wanted to be a sister. And they used that, they, they measured the intellectual function based on the syntactical complexity and other things of those paragraphs. So they knew what you looked like mm -hmm. when you were, say, 18 or 20. And then they followed them all the way into their 80s and their 90s. So this is a very, in the, the other part of it is that this is a group of women who, for instance, didn't abuse themselves uh, physically or with alcohol or other things. So you really controlled as many of these things as is humanly possible. Uh, and many of these sisters uh, lived to be very, very old. And, and the data really has been quite helpful in us understanding this. All right, great. Okay, well on that note, uh, is there a vaccine for Alzheimer's? Yeah, it's, it's, that's an interesting question. The answer is yes. The more important question is, is it safe and does it work? And is it answer, safe and does it work? And, uh, <laughs> and the answer is we're unsure right now. Mm -hmm. the, the cause of Alzheimer's disease is unknown. Some people think that it is produced by excessive amounts of this abnormal uh, protein amyloid, which is deposited in the brain and disrupts brain function. Mm -hmm. The thought was that if you could develop a vaccine that would immunize the body against the amyloid that your own immune cells would go in and clean it out. Mm -hmm. And there were some animal models that suggested that. Uh, unfortunately, that amyloid is not only deposited in the brain tissue, but it's also deposited in blood vessels. So when they created the vaccine that provoked an inflammatory response, it not only attacked the amyloid that was in the brain tissue, but in the blood vessels. And that produced vasculitis. Mm. And because of that, in the human studies, what happened was that the individuals who uh, had been injected with the vaccine, some of them developed encephalitis and died, mm. and they have stopped that study. There is a second part that's oftentimes not talked about, and that is it's not clear that amyloid is causative in Alzheimer's disease. It may play a role, but not clear that it's causative. We know that there are elderly people who are intellectually intact mm -hmm. at the time that they die that have a very high amyloid load. So the whole understanding of what causes Alzheimer's disease is still up in the air. And until we know what causes it, then saying we're going to have an ironclad cure is a little bit presumptuous. OK. What about vitamins, minerals, anything like that that can help? There's been an interesting study on vitamin E. Vitamin E was compared with a Parkinsonian medicine and looked at in a controlled study for a little over a year. And in that study, they did see a delay in time to nursing home placement. Cognition wasn't statistically affected. It was very close, but not statistically significant. Therefore, vitamin E has been proposed to help keep people out of nursing homes. That is the only endpoint, however, that was actually studied, and it was only at very high doses, 2,000 international units, which is much higher than the 400 to 1,000 we typically see people taking. So there's probably some credence to taking vitamin E as a preventative measure. However, for treatment of Alzheimer's disease, it has an unclear role. It's simply not been studied. Okay. Other vitamins, other items such as aluminum, for example, there's really not a lot of credence. There's been some theories and concerns. For example, dialysis patients uh, in the early stages of dialysis uh, often developed a dementia syndrome that was found to be secondary to accumulation of certain heavy metals, certain metals including aluminum. Okay. And therefore it was concerning to the public that aluminum buildup could cause dementia. People started throwing away their aluminum, aluminum pots, pots and pans. Right, I remember right. that, yeah. Right, there's never been really any scientific evidence to suggest that day-to-day -day exposure to normal aluminum items has any role in causing a dementia. Okay, what about the intellectual stimulation? I mean, we've talked about the nuns and we've, um, encouraging people once they get mm -hmm. into this age to to keep their minds active work crossword puzzles or read does that help stave off uh, some of of what we're seeing well it's unclear because the studies would take decades to right. do but it is very clear that the brain 
uh, retains the ability to rewire itself. Uh, so for instance, if you lose a brain cell here, the cells on either side can rewire to fill the empty space. That's called plasticity. Mm -hmm. It's also clear that that plasticity continues into the eighth and maybe even the ninth decade. So even if you're 75, 85, you still have some ability to rewire yourself. What are the things that stimulate that rewiring? Well, it's, we believe that probably it has to do with intellectual stimulation. More importantly, though, it's novel intellectual stimulation. It's not doing the same thing over and over again, mm -hmm. but, but presenting your brain with new intellectual challenges that causes it to sort of rewire itself and bring neurons, nerve cells online that may be sitting there quietly. All of the data that I have looked at so far indicates that, that uh, intellectual and physical stimulation probably are going to uh, show a mild protective role in helping us to hold on to our intellectual abilities as we grow older. Uh, Dr. Harris, I know you've done a series of videotapes on dementia. Could you tell us about those? One of the things that we realize is that uh, many of the uh, issues that were discussed here uh, are, are uh, CNA educational programs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's very hard uh, to, to present these kinds of ideas using terminology that is familiar to CNAs. Uh, so what we have done uh, is we've developed a series of training tapes, each of which is about 20 to 30 minutes long, so it fits in well with the routine in the nursing home, that covers important issues like redirection, uh, uh, management of an aggressive patient, feeding, hydration, that sort of thing. Actually, we developed them initially for assisted living, but now the nursing homes use them. Each of the tapes has several components. One has a explaining how the brain works, because we want to impart a message of professionalism to these CNAs. With all of the statistics we've been showing today, they're running a neuropsychiatric service. Mm. So they should be proud of the fact that they're neuropsychiatric experts, and we provide them with that information. The second part is what is called the empathy chip, where we help uh, people to understand what it's like to have Alzheimer's disease through little vignettes. Mm -hmm. It's sort of walk a mile in the shoes of an Alzheimer patient. And the third part of it is tips from other CNAs or PCAs on how they manage it. Not, you know, talking head kind of people, but right. real folks who are in the trenches taking care of these folks. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, we produce these tapes through the Center for Public Television. They are also meant to be used in conjunction with our, what are called our DITA Brain Series, which is training materials for the licensed professionals. Those are 10 tapes that are about 40 minutes each, and they're meant for like nurses and social workers and people like that. So the, the way the system works when we talk about an integrated system is that you first have to train the licensed professionals because they're not going to try to train the non-licensed professionals unless they know it first. Right. So you train the licensed professionals, and then they can take these training materials which mirror the same information but at, at basically a 10th to 12th grade level, mm -hmm. and they can present that to the, uh, to the CNAs. And then the third part of it is for families. We have what's called the Dita Family Series, which is printed in videotape materials, which presents the same information, but only at, from the perspective of the family caregiver. And if those who are watching want to get those tapes, where should they go? If they, if they go onto my website at www.alsbrain.org, uh, we, uh, we have a way of distributing them. We don't make any money off these. Okay. It's all done through the Center for Public Television, and it's, all, it's basically supported by the, the legislature in Alabama to make sure that everybody gets the training that they need. Great. Dr. Crisillas, let me come back to you. Let's talk about massage therapy in dementia. Okay. Uh, massage therapy is one of many different kind of stimulation therapies one can invoke. Uh, touch therapy. When accepted by the patient, when the patient is addressed correctly and appropriately, uh, massage therapy in several controlled studies has been shown to have a beneficial effect. In many such studies, such as this, where there's either massage therapy, therapeutic touch, music therapy, sometimes the results are a little inconsistent. This is sometimes because we're looking at a heterogeneous population of patients. When you pick a patient group of Alzheimer's patients, some may have diffuse Lewy body, some may have other types of dementia, some may be in mild stages, some may be in moderate. So the conclusions can be somewhat difficult to interpret unless you look at subtypes. But in general, massage therapy has been shown to have a beneficial effect, especially perhaps for those people in pain. Those people that suffer from verbal uh, non-aggressive behavior have been shown to have benefit. 
Um, and in general, it's one of those modalities that, in general, it doesn't hurt to try and see if the mm -hmm. patient accepts it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I have another question that came in, and it says, if someone has lost the ability to talk, uh, can they have a remission? Um, I think this is the way they said it. When they, then they're able to talk again? Is that... I would, I would think that applies mainly if they become delirious. Okay. You can make an argument that delirium, especially in its subacute uh, hypoactive stage, we tend to think of delirium as this overactive, wildly acting person. In many nursing home patients, they're hypoactive. They withdraw. They're quiet. Mm -hmm. That's still delirium. So those people may be mistakenly felt to have an expressive aphasia when, in fact, they're delirious. Okay. The other thing that you think about also is depression. Some people can become severely depressed, and, and it's not that they can't talk, that they won't talk they won't anymore. Talk. Anytime a person stops and then starts again, somebody should do a very, sh you should rejoice that they're talking, right. but you should also do a very meticulous evaluation, asking the question, why did they quit talking? Okay. Well, we're about to wrap up, so what I'd like to ask you uh, is if there's any final thoughts, anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we uh, sign off. Well, I think that uh, the, um, from our perspective, from my perspective, the most important person on the team, I agree with Dr. Casillas, is the CNA. And that everything that we've talked about today with regards to behavior management is only going to work if we make sure that that CNA workforce understands the valuable role that it fills, understands the behavior management that they need to execute, and is, is motivated to provide that kind of care. Okay. Dr. Casillas? I'd just like to add to that the concept of communication. It's very important to communicate that we allow the CNA to have input. Sometimes they're ignored. We also need to make certain that the family is included. The family can have extremely valuable insight. We sometimes may get annoyed at families by thinking they're trying to play doctor. Mm -hmm. They just need to be redirected. We need them to give us the symptoms they're seeing, not the diagnoses. Right. Don't jump to conclusions, but tell me everything you're observing so I can help interpret it with you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for today's show. Uh, thanks to our participants and to everyone who uh, faxed in their questions and called in. Keep thinking about the topic because our next show on this topic is going to air on March 26th. And we're going to focus on issues that arise as nursing home surveyors evaluate the provision of care for residents with dementia. And as Sharon said at the beginning of this program, we're hoping to hear from surveyors with issues uh, you'd like to see discussed by our expert panel. The deadline for contacting us with those issues is March 12th. You can send faxes to CMS at 1-410-786-6730. Mark your fax Dementia Show. Or you can send your questions by email to kshaneman at cms.hhs.gov. And remember, again, that you can see this entire broadcast for up to one year from this date at http colon forward slash forward slash cms.internetstreaming.com. Uh, on a non-dementia note, please be sure to join us for our very next broadcast on March 12th when we'll be joined by Dr. Jeannie Kayser-Jones and Dr. Thomas uh, Finnecane for a look at the topic of hydration. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Doris McMillan. Have a great day. <music>